Welcome everyone to QuickBooks for newer nonprofit desktop users. Thanks so much for joining us for today's TechSoup webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to make sure everyone is comfortable using ReadyTalk, the webinar platform we are on today. You can chat in this box on the lower left side of your screen to let us know if you have any problems with the audio or have questions for our presenter. We will be taking your questions and chatting with you throughout the webinar, so feel free to chat with us at any time you feel moved to do so. We will keep all lines muted today to get a nice clear recording of today's webinar so you can watch it again at your convenience or share it with your friends and colleagues. If you lose your Internet connection, please reconnect using the link that was emailed to you in the confirmation or reminder emails. If you received an email from me an hour ago or registered within the past hour, if you look on the right side of that email there is a link where you can download today's slides. But keep in mind a lot of today's content will be shared live on screen by our presenter. So you, you can watch along with us on the slide portions, but you really do want to be here live. This is a 90-minute webinar, so we hope you'll be able to stay with us throughout the whole event. Um, if you're hearing the audio through your computer speakers and you're hearing an echo, you may be logged in more than once to ReadyTalk and you'll need to close any additional instances. If at any time the slides or the live screen sharing does not stay in sync with the audio, we recommend dialing in toll free to the number that Allie is chatting out into the chat window to you. You can reach out at any time to ReadyTalk support at 800-843-9166 if you have any technical issues that we are not able to help you solve. We will be recording today's event. We will make it available on our website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. This is also where you can find our upcoming webinars and events and a full archive of our prior events. Within a couple of days you will also be able to find today's webinar on our YouTube channel at TechSoup Video. You will receive an email from me that includes the full follow-up, the recording that you can watch at your convenience, any links to products, any links to resources within the next few days. You can feel free to tweet along with us at TechSoup or using the hashtag TSWebinars. I'm Becky Wiegand and I am your webinar host for today. I'm really glad to have you joining us. And uh, joining us as our primary presenter today, our expert on hand is Greg S. Bosson, CPA, who is the founder and CEO of QuickBooks Made Easy. He is uh, an advanced certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a full service accounting firm in Hotlanta, Georgia as I like to call it. Uh, and he is the founder of QuickBooks Made Easy, one of TechSoup's partners in providing training resources to you on QuickBooks. Since 2000, Greg has been teaching live QuickBooks seminars around the country designed for nonprofits. And he is really an expert in uh, pre presenting on this topic and has done this with us many times. If you've had the pleasure of watching him before, he's also a really entertaining presenter to have with us. So I'm really glad to have you joining us today. You'll see on the back end assisting with chat, we've got Carol Waterfield, Jennifer Maddox, and David Webb also from QuickBooks Made Easy. They'll be helping answer your questions one-on-one -on -one in the chat tool throughout the webinar. You'll also see Allison Bliss and Ali Bazdikian from TechSoup who will be on hand to help you with any technical issues and answer any questions about TechSoup's programs. Looking at what we hope to cover today, we will be looking at what QuickBooks products are available, how to get around in the desktop version, uh, we are focused on the desktop version today, so if you are using QuickBooks Online, we have a second event that we are running on Thursday with Greg focused specifically on QuickBooks Online. And we will share that link out in the chat for those of you who may be more interested in that product or interested in both. You can attend both. They are free and, and you are welcome to join us for them. We will talk quickly about which QuickBooks product is maybe the best for your purposes. So we will uh, give you some scenarios of what may be the best fit for your organization's needs if you are new to selecting one. Then Greg will share live on his desktop the proper setup of the chart of accounts, where and how to track programs, where and how to enter donors, members, or students into your QuickBooks setup, how to enter budgets, getting budget to actual reports easily, and the best way to enter income, and he'll show two different methods for that. We will have time for questions. So if you're joining us and you're not newer to the QuickBooks desktop version, and maybe you have some advanced questions, we will be trying to answer those too. But this is focused on QuickBooks for newer nonprofit desktop users. So if you've been using it for 25 years, you may find that there's a lot of good um, review or that the setup may be different than what you're using. So that could be interesting to watch. 
but we aren't focusing on advanced users today. But we will try and answer some of your questions as we can. Quickly before we get started with content at hand, uh, I'll talk about TechSoup in case you're new to us. We are everywhere in the world that is blue on this map, which is a lot of places. So if you are looking to uh, access technology donations, resources, connect with other social change agents around the world, uh, meet with technologists in different communities, look at this map. And if you see your, your country on it, we are there. Uh, feel free to chat in from where you are joining today in the chat window. If you are joining us from outside the United States, I recommend visiting TechSoup.Global where you can find a drop-down and select your country if you are not in the United States. Today's discussion of the different donation programs and discount programs is focused on the United States. So if you are joining from elsewhere, you may or may not be able to access similar donations in your own country, but that's where I recommend checking out that website. TechSoup has been around since 1987, connecting technology creators with nonprofit, foundation, church, and library do-gooders all around the world. We've helped facilitate $5.4 billion in donations and grants to that sector in that time, and I'm proud to be part of it. So looking at the topic at hand, the Intuit Donation Program, I'll cover a little bit more about this later on in the program as well. But I just wanted to highlight this for those of you who are looking at the different QuickBooks donations available to you. You can see those at TechSoup.org slash Intuit. That's the company that makes QuickBooks. You can access the QuickBooks Premier 1 user license, the QuickBooks Premier 3 user license. For example, if you have an office manager that enters receipts and you need to coordinate with an accountant to do your 990s, or a board member who enters, you would need this 3 user license. We also have QuickBooks for Mac and a QuickBooks Online subscription. You can either do a new subscription or a renewal. Eligibility is for 501c3 nonprofits and public libraries with operating budgets of $10 million or less. And if you are one of these types of organizations, legislative, political, or advocacy organization, unfortunately you are not eligible for this donation program. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and have Greg Bosson, our expert on the line today, joining us uh, to introduce himself a little bit more and tell us a little bit about QuickBooks Made Easy, and then take us through QuickBooks for newer nonprofit desktop users. Welcome to the program, Greg. We're really glad to have you. Thank you, Becky. How's it going? Everybody say hello. I'd like you to chat hi. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. So I can see your chat actually, so say hi. And Britta, Britta asked a really long involved question about payroll, uh, uh, which I'll try and cover at some point, Britta. But I want you to know that I can actually see you guys when you say hello. So there we go. We got Bonnie, Wendy, we recognize Jacinta. Yep. You can't all see each other's messages, and that's yes. just a limitation of the tool. But if there's anything interesting that's being chatted about on the back end, we'll try and chat that back out to you. Yeah. But for the most part, we'll, we'll be trying to work our tails off to answer all of your questions as they come in and interact with you as we're able during the webinar. Cool. Yeah, because we got a ton of people here ready to answer your questions. I'm going to answer some questions live as we go through. So we are here to serve. Hello Steve. Steve actually said, Hi Greg. The rest of them just said hi. But I think you're still saying hello. That's good. Alright, so uh, oh, Mississippi Delta from Jennifer. See, we're going to be, we're going to be, hey, uh, who, who is from another country? From another country, say what country uh, uh, you're from. I'd be curious to see. Uh, uh, San Diego. No, right now we have country. about 670 people on the line awesome. with us right now. We said the Dominican Republic, Canada, Guam, another yeah. Guam. Uh, awesome. Most looks like it's from the U.S. So thanks everyone for joining us from wherever you're here from. We have somebody from India. Thank you for joining us at whatever time of the evening it is there, I imagine. Uh, cool. Glad to have you on the line. All right. Well, let's get rolling. So, uh, uh, so basically I'm a CPA with an accounting practice in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been in practice for about 25 years. Uh, we specialize in nonprofits. We do audits of nonprofits. We do about 70 or 80 990s at this point. Uh, and then we have a few hundred nonprofits that we have tech support agreements and we help them throughout the year. So we've got a ton of nonprofits that we do work with. That's kind of one part of my accounting practice is a real accounting practice. And then the, the rest of it is QuickBooks Made Easy. And QuickBooks Made Easy is all about teaching people how to use QuickBooks 
and we specialize in two main industries. One of them is construction contractors, and the other one is nonprofit organizations. So uh, we're all about teaching nonprofits how to use QuickBooks to track all the funky things that you guys have to track. Uh, and how do we do that? We kind of have three ways uh, that we do it. Uh, we provide we have DVD training products that come along with handbooks. I think there's a little picture of it here on the right. Uh, that's a set, the essentials and beyond the essentials. We also have technical support agreements that you can sign up for. Uh, we actually have a discounted rate if you guys feel like, you know what, Greg can help me. Let me get a tech support agreement with them. I can do that. Uh, and then we have live seminars and webinars that we do across the country. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the next slide here just to show you where we're going to be coming up. Uh, so actually next week we're in Denver, and then we're in Phoenix. Uh, and uh, the big thing that I kind of wanted to point out, if you guys like this webinar, because this is kind of like a mini webinar. We have an expanded webinar. It's a three-day series, and it's happening actually August 9th through 11th. I think that's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and uh, that's for anybody who has the desktop. So it will be two hours a day, six hours all together. I know that sounds painful, but we're really going to have fun, so you'll see. Uh, so if you like what you're learning, that's something that you may be interested in doing as well. And we're going to have a discount for that as well. And actually, I'll point it. Uh, here we go. So here's the little coupon codes. At some point I'll show you where you go to sign up for these things. But right now let's just get into QuickBooks. But I'll tell you that if you want to go to the three-day webinar, here's a little coupon code. You get uh, $50 off coming to the three-day webinar series. And if you'd rather learn by just talking to me, big fat discount on the tech support here. It's usually $300. We're going to give it to you for $149. Uh, but we'll talk more about that later. So let's. Uh, I just wanted to put this back in here. Again, what we're going to go over today. So today we understand that we're newer QuickBooks users, so I kind of designed the webinar for newers. Uh, we're going to talk about what the different products are that are available, how to get around in the program. That's kind of like navigation. What you should pick as the best QuickBooks product. And then how to set up your accounts how to set up your programs, how to set up your donors, members, or students, how to enter a budget, how to get budget to actual reports. And then towards the end we'll get into the specifics of entering some transactions. We're going to talk about a couple of different ways of entering the uh, income transactions, donations, and stuff like that. Uh, how to get a thank you letter out of QuickBooks. We'll show you that. Uh, and then we will end, we'll hopefully end with 20 minutes left, and we'll be able to do questions. Uh, so anything uh, that you want to ask. Now I'll probably break as we go through here and take some live questions, but you guys can do questions throughout. Uh, I know somebody wanted to know if we were going to cover in-kind contributions. I can certainly cover it if we have time. Uh, we'll do that at the end. But there's all kinds of stuff uh, that will definitely be covered in the three-day webinar. All right. So let's move to – this is uh, ah, this is just a generic sort of slide to make, help you understand if you've never been in QuickBooks before. It's a financial software package. It does the accounting. It does invoicing. It tracks and does your bills. If you'd like it, it'll do payroll. That's an extra add-on. Uh, oh, and Britta. Britta wanted to know, and you guys all might want to listen to this. Well, hopefully you should listen to everything I'm saying. But um, Britta has payroll that gets paid from different funding sources, different grants. She'd like to be able to spread the payroll between the grants so she can tell how much uh, money from each grant is being used to pay payroll. She wants to be able to get a little P&L for a grant is really what she wants so she can report it to the funder. Uh, and you can do that. Uh, you need to be doing it within QuickBooks Payroll. So Britta, your answer is yes. You don't have to do big fancy journal entries. It happens automatically provided you use one of the QuickBooks Payroll services. Um, if not, then I can show you another way of doing it. I'll be doing it at the webinar. but. Using the QuickBooks Payroll is by far the easiest. And guys, I don't work for Intuit, so I'm not here to sell you on QuickBooks. So don't worry about that. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then QuickBooks, uh, it can be a donor database, and we'll see a little bit about how that works. So it's not bad. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of what QuickBooks is. And let's do a poll right now. This kind of helps me get an idea of uh, where you're, where you guys are in your level of experience. So. How new are you to QuickBooks? We have never seen it, feeling nauseated. Uh, we have saw it, but closed it, scary. Uh, kind of know QuickBooks, but not really well. I think a lot of you will be in that area. Uh, 
here's something. I know QuickBooks, but not for nonprofits, because the setup is very different for nonprofits than it is for everybody else. Um, I know QuickBooks for nonprofits, uh, uh, but I still have questions is basically what that means. Uh, and then we have, I'm a QuickBooks master, and I'm here to heckle you, hopefully. Uh, and then there's another. There's an other. Well, other is kind of interesting. So we will uh, – let's look. I'm going to let you guys – we still have a few more of you that need to respond. Every single person I'm going to be waiting for. So you guys can't – you have to listen to me. It's important to my um, emotional state. Uh, so uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, oh, we've got a few chats. So we've got – all right, I think I'm going to go 700 ahead. 700 people, yeah, wow. 700 people weighing in. So we're giving a little bit of time for everyone to vote. Okay. Um, and like I said, feel free to chat in. We'll go ahead and skip to the results, and you can keep voting if it's on your screen and you haven't voted yet. But all right, 55% so here I go. almost know it, but not well. So that's uh, – Yeah, that's what I figured. A great so majority of folks. Yeah, it's half of them, half of them. That's right. So that kind of helps me. Uh, those of you that know QuickBooks pretty well, don't worry, we'll have time for you with questions. And you may find some things related to setup that you didn't even know. So, uh, so the first thing I want to cover, uh, Philip says she, he doesn't know it for nonprofits. That's what a lot of people are, are uh, like when they come to these webinars. So the first thing I want to cover is the different choices that you have if you are going to get QuickBooks. Some of them you can get at TechSoup. Some of them are not available at TechSoup. I want to go over all of them. Okay, and then I'll tell you what I think the best is for you guys. Okay? So we have – there are five choices of QuickBooks. All right? And the first one is already uh, listed there. It's called QuickBooks Pro. This is your basic QuickBooks that you purchase at Costco or Sam's or something like that. You can get it from Intuit. It retails for – I feel like it's $275 or something like that, but I think you can get it at the stores for like maybe $180. If anybody has Pro, tell me. Type pro in the, uh, in the chat, P-R-O. Yeah, Amber is using pro. So listen, if you have pro, there's a number of you. Don't listen, listen to me. You're going to be able to do your QuickBooks for your nonprofit. You don't need to be the nonprofit edition. Okay? So don't let anybody tell you you have to get the nonprofit edition. QuickBooks Pro is fine. All right? So that's the first thing. Uh, the second option is what most people have. This is the one that's available at the TechSoup website. It's QuickBooks Premier Nonprofit. And this product, it's basically QuickBooks Pro with a couple of extra things which really aren't that different than Pro. Um, and it's actually – the retail of QuickBooks Premier is pretty expensive. I feel like it's $475 or something like that. This is the thing that Becky was telling you you can get for 50 bucks at TechSoup. It's amazing. So QuickBooks Premier Nonprofit, this is probably what a lot of you – I'm seeing a lot of people here have Pro. Uh, so um, all right, and then now people are telling me if you have the Nonprofit Edition. I bet you most of you do. So we might have done a poll on that. Now the third option is Enterprise Solutions. Enterprise Solutions – the Mac people, don't worry, we'll get to you. Uh, the Enterprise Solutions – this program is fairly expensive. I think you can get it for around $1,500 or more. It's exactly like the Premier Nonprofit and Pro. It's exactly the same. The screens look the same. It works the same. The only thing is it's more powerful. It's more robust. Let me give you an example. If you have uh, QuickBooks Premier or QuickBooks Pro, the maximum number of donors that you could put in the customer list is 14,500. If you have Enterprise Solutions – if anybody has Enterprise, chat me up, say Enterprise. Uh, if you have Enterprise, you can have over 100,000 donors. So it's really meant for larger nonprofits. All right? So here, Peggy. Peggy has Enterprise. So does Gordon. Uh, so that's two people that have Enterprise Solution. Kristen does as well. Okay? So I'm going to be teaching using the Premier Nonprofit, but Enterprise Solutions, it basically is the same thing. All right? So those three choices, these are softwares that you either purchase online and download to your computer, so the programs on your computer, or you go to the store, you buy it, you put the DVD or the CD in your computer, and you load it. Okay? And those are for computers that are PC-based. Okay? If, however, you have a Macintosh and you want to download something, you have a choice. It's called QuickBooks for the Mac. 
It's the only choice you have if you want to download a piece of software to your computer, and it's very much like QuickBooks Pro. And go ahead and say Mac so I can see uh, Dr. Sher uh, Shepherd has Mac. Uh, and uh, so yeah, Vicky, Alex. So we've got some Mac users here. Daryl. Isn't it nice that I'm acknowledging all of the Mac users? You know? But uh, all right. So that's QuickBooks for the Mac, and everything that we do, pretty much you're going to be able to do with the exception of no. Pretty much everything, yeah, everything we do today you're going to be able to do in Mac. Now there's one other option, and that's the online people. And the online software is very different than the desktop. And uh, as Becky said, if you have the online software, you are in the wrong webinar, unless you just want to pay attention and learn about the desktop. Uh, the webinar for the online edition is happening, I think it's Thursday, right? Becky? I think it's Thursday. But anyway. Yep, Thursday, 11 o'clock to 12.30 Pacific, which is cool. 2 to 3.30 Eastern. So join awesome. us if you are on the Mac. Great. So here's the two that I would recommend for pretty much everybody. If you want a desktop program, you want to get the Premier Nonprofit because it's the cheapest one. You can get it at TechSoup for 50 bucks. If you would rather be in the cloud, uh, then you want to get the Online Edition. The obvious question is, which one should I get? Well, here's the deal. Okay? Now listen, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. People that have been using QuickBooks a long time, they freak out at the Online Edition because it looks very different than the desktop. I'll show it to you in a second. But the Online Edition is good if – are you ready? – you don't really have any employees, and you don't really do restricted grants too much. Okay? A uh, small organization, all volunteer organization, no employees, res no restricted grants, probably okay. okay? Now, if you have, the reason why I say this is because, and this has something to do with what Britta said, payroll needs to be split between grants and between programs if you're a nonprofit. We'll talk about that later. Can't do it very easily in the online edition can do it fairly easily in the desktop edition. It's just much easier to do. So for those reasons, I say if you got a lot of employees, you got restricted grants, desktop is probably for you. Um, pretty small organization, no employees, online, I'm okay with. Okay? So uh, oh, Teela's from Atlanta. Hey, how you doing, Teela? I don't know if I said that right or not. Anyway. All right, so here's one more poll, very important. Uh, I just I don't know. This is just something other than accounting I wanted to ask. So who would you most like to see in concert? We have Adele, Fleetwood Mac, Lincoln Park, uh, Elton John, Rihanna, Sinatra. Now Sinatra is no longer living. Is that correct, Becky? Somebody? You yes, can that's yeah, no, you guys are cracking me up. <laughs> All right, okay. So, you know, um, you guys were showing your age a little bit in the uh, this poll when when you sent it to me. It was spelled Lincoln like Abraham Lincoln. Oh, so well, I told David had, to, had to nab that. you on that one. <laughs> All right. So uh, and then finally, if you wanted to, well, there's Johnny Cash, and then if you wanted to, you could see me. So oh my gosh, we've got 30 people so far that want to see me. I think that's really impressive. This gives me an idea of you know just the type of. And by the way, I do want to see every one of these groups. Uh, okay. Be honest with you, even Lincoln Park. Uh, I'm not really into that kind of music usually, but I do like Lincoln Park a lot. So um, anyway, so we'll skip to the results here. We're at around 500 so far. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who wins. You ready? There we go. Oh, it's pretty spread evenly. So Adele wins. But universally, it seems like people like Adele. Yeah. The uh, SNL yeah. skit from but Thanksgiving look at, brings look, families together. Um, but look at Franklin so look Mac at, and Lincoln Park. Yeah, right. No, they're popular, and a lot of people are pointing out that a number of these people are dead, so uh, we'd have to watch a hologram <laughs> concert. Uh, let's go ahead and get us started on right. the, the showing of QuickBooks at this point. We've had yeah, a lot of fun so we'll with the polls, so thank yeah, you so for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen now, and I'm going to. One thing that always happens in these webinars is that my mouse tends to move. Uh, faster for me than it does for you guys. So I'm going to really move the mouse kind of slow. Okay? So, um, Please let us know in the chat if you have a hard time seeing or if the page doesn't render. If it falls out of sync with Greg's audio, we recommend dialing into that toll-free phone number because it usually stays in sync better than the streaming audio. Yes. So let us know how it looks. 
All right, so here we go. So um, we've talked about um, the, uh, the QuickBooks products and which product is best. Um, I want to talk about getting around in the desktop. So this is for the people that don't really know it very well. So right now what we're looking at is the home page. And when you click on the icon, QuickBooks opens up. Let me see if I can minimize this. Um, yeah, there we go. QuickBooks opens up, and uh, this is what you see. So for people that are new, let me get you comfortable with it. So the, the bar at the very top here that says Sample Synergy Now, QuickBooks Premier Nonprofit, this is actually called the Title Bar. And it's telling you two things. I'm going to zoom in here. It's telling you two things. One thing it's telling you is what the, what program you're using. And I'm using Premier Nonprofit 2016. The other thing that it's telling you is what company file we're in, Sample Synergy Now. Uh, and the reason why is because if you are if you've purchased the desktop version of QuickBooks, you can run more than one company. You can run two, you can run five, you can run ten, you can run a hundred. And so you probably want to make sure you're in the right company when you go to open QuickBooks. And that's why it tells you. Okay? Now I will tell you that people get confused about this because you know the program Microsoft Word? That you understand that that's the program, but then you have your documents. And everybody has like more than one Word document, right? And when you open up Microsoft Word, you just click on it, and it opens up a blank screen, and you've got to hunt for your document. So you understand that there's the program and there's the document. Those are two separate things. It's the same thing in QuickBooks. When you, uh, there's QuickBooks the program, but then you have what they call the data file. And that's the thing that has all your transactions in it and all of your lists and your chart of accounts and stuff like that. And the thing is those are two different things. But it's hard to understand that when you're first getting started in QuickBooks because unlike Word, you know, when you click on Word, it opens up a blank Word. But when you open up QuickBooks, it opens up the program, and then boom, it opens up the last data file you were ever in. And the reason why is because most people only have one data file. Well, those of you that have more than one data file, you guys, what they do is they go here to File, and then I'm just going to go to Open or Restore Company. Because if that's not the data file I want to work in, I'll click on Open or Restore Company. I'll click on Next. And then you're going to see a list. Of this Basically, you're in Microsoft Windows now. Look at all the different data files we use. Okay? I use a bunch of them. So you pick the one you want, and then you open up that one. So that's kind of the deal. Okay. So I'll throw something else in real quick. Uh, and that is one way to make sure that you, get, you don't get confused about what data file you're in. I know mean, this has the name of it. But also you can change the color. You see how this is dark blue? If I go to my Preferences, and they're under the Edit menu, and I click on Preferences, there's so many different preferences. They're broken into different categories. These are all the categories down the side. I'm in the general category, and I'm looking at preferences. If I go to the desktop view category and click color file or company file color scheme, I can change it just for this data file. So I'll change it to green lime. And now it looks like this. That'll only, that color will only be there for this company. So anyway, enough of that. So that's the title bar. The other three things that you see on this computer screen here uh, are basically the different ways of getting around. There are three ways of getting around. Now I'll just zoom in. Well, I don't even need to zoom in. This main one is the home page. And this is what I want you guys to use if you were new to QuickBooks. And by that, I mean six months or less. Use the home page. It has these little pretty icons on it. And the thing I like about it is it does stuff. It shows you how to do stuff in the order that you're supposed to do it because you just follow the arrows. It's like a flow chart. First you enter a bill, then you pay a bill. Okay? So, uh, but these, and it also doesn't have everything QuickBooks does. It just has the major stuff, so it's not too overwhelming. But if I want to write a check, here's my little icon. I click on it. Here's a picture of a check. This is check 1001. Don't forget that number, 1001. Okay? The second way of getting around is this fat bar up here. What's this fat bar called? You guys chat it up. I can't see the chat anymore, so um, Becky or David, you'll have to tell me what the answers are. What's this fat bar here? 
has all these little pictures. I'm waiting for all of the smart responses to come in to tell us what it is. Yeah, what is I this? I see map? Anita saying taskbar. Not a taskbar. I see, I see Michael saying ribbon. Kathy saying menu bar. No, no. Uh, no. Pat says ribbon. <laughs> Sheila says tool. David says icon bar. Ding, 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 Meg, ding, 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 ding. Icon, icon bar. bar. Icon you win, bar. Gold this star. This is called the icon bar. And the icon bar. It gives you some of the things that QuickBooks does, but not all of them. You can actually customize this icon bar, take away things you don't want, add things that you do. If I click Write a Check, I'm going to click it. Do you see how it opened up the exact same check number, check 1001? Highlighting these are different ways to get to the exact same place in the program. Okay? So we got the home page here. We got the icon bar up here. Now the icon bar can be on the top. But yours may be on the side. If you click on View and you go to Left, now it's on the side and it looks like this. Okay, but it's still the same little pictures and you can scroll. Okay, here's the check right there. Okay. It used to be on the top and then about four years ago they moved it to the left-hand side. And those of us that have been using QuickBooks for a while, we don't like change. And so we freaked out. So they made it to where we could move it back up on the top again. So we feel okay. Whew, I feel better about myself. Now I'm, I know some of you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, that's the icon bar. That's the home page. Now the little thin bar, what's that called? Somebody said it before when I was asking about the fat bar. What's this called? It has these drop down, what is it called? Let's see, I see menu bar, That's it, ribbon, menu tool bar, bar task bar. All it's right, the menu, menu bar, bar it is. Yes, so this is the menu bar. bar. Menu bar gives you everything QuickBooks does. Okay? So it's organized by area. If I want to write a check, I'm going to go under banking, I'm going to click write checks. And here's that same check that popped up 1001. So all three of these ways, the menu bar, the icon bar, and the home page all do the same thing ultimately. They basically allow you to navigate through QuickBooks. All right? So the only thing I didn't cover is this stuff over on the left-hand side here. Now, I'm an honest guy. So this stuff is somewhat irrelevant. I mean, they give you some balances in some of the accounts, which is kind of cool. But most of this is a giant advertisement. All right? See, order checks and supplies. If you click on that, it will take you to the Intuit website where you can order checks from them. But you can order checks somewhere else if you want to. So what I'm going to do is if you are feeling overwhelmed when you look at your screen, just hide this. Just do that. And then you'll know everything that's on the screen. <laughs> but anyway, so that was kind of stupid. But uh, that's the whole getting around thing. So let me take a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to how to set up and what the best setup is for your chart of accounts. Anybody got any questions about how to kind of navigate around sure. something on the screen you don't know Yeah, well we had – we had a couple of questions asking, what if you don't have an icon bar? Is it something that is new in later no. versions? No, it's or been it around for years. And I'm so glad you asked that. See, if you go to View, do you see where it says Hide Icon Bar? If you don't have one, somebody's hidden it. And that's of what yours looks like. So you can just go to View and click either Top or Left. I'll do Top, and then it brings it back. Next question. And is it in that same spot that you'd move it from the top to the left? I know you kind of showed yes. that really You go quickly. to View. Here's Top. Here's Left. If I click Left, it moves it to the left. If I click Top, it moves it to the top. Let's take another question, and then we'll move on. Great. Um, you know, a lot of these are not directly related to the navigation, and we're working on answering a lot of them on the back end. Um, let's see. You know, somebody asked, uh, since we are doing the online event on Thursday, what if their organization is using both online and desktop version, or if they are looking to use the online version and currently use the desktop? Is it an easy process to migrate your data? Between it is. Two? It is an easy process to migrate your data. So listen carefully. Everybody listen. If you are in the desktop and you decide for whatever reason that you want to go to the online edition, uh, then what you would want to do is if you go into your desktop version, you click File, and then I believe, where is it? Is it Utilities? And uh, here it is. 
copy, com copy company file for QuickBooks Online. And that will upload your data file and create an online account for you, and it will appear in the online edition. Now it's not meant to go back and forth, guys. It's kind of like I'm making a change. I'm going to the online. In the online edition, it works the very same way. I think I have the online edition pulled up here. I have to sign in again. Uh, and this is actually good. Look how different the online edition is from the desktop version. This is why people that uh, are used to the online are used to desktop freak out. Look at the online edition. But anyway, if you, go, if you decide you want to go back to desktop, you click the little gear here, and then you see where it says Export Data. Push that, and it will create a copy of your data file that can be read, and it will give it to you in an email, and you open it up in the desktop edition. So it's pretty simple. So I'm going to go back to my desktop since that's what we're talking about. And now let's get into some meat. So we're going to talk about your chart of accounts and what they should look like. So let me just say one thing before I do that. I'm going to get rid of the home page here. The whole purpose of accounting is to create two reports. What are those two reports? Can somebody chat me up and just let me know? I'll go ahead and read them off as yeah. you come in. We have Christine, Christelle says balance sheet. Balance sheet is one of them. And the other, you're done. And the other one is the there you go. They're done. Well done, everyone. So they're P and L. So the whole purpose of accounting is to create these two reports. Uh, and so all accounting is is entering transactions, so they end up on these two reports. And what you want to do, guys, is you want to enter transactions so that you can give these reports to your board. You want to balance sheet you give to the board, and you want a profit and loss compared to budget that you give to the board. Okay? And the lines that are on your chart of accounts list are the lines that make up these two financial statements. To get to your chart of accounts list, you go to Lists, Chart of Accounts, and here it is. And then if you see here, you see how on the balance sheet it says Checking, Savings, Membership Receivable, and then down here Prepaid Insurance. It came from the chart of accounts, checking, savings, membership, prepaid. And over here on the P&L, uh, these accounts are broken up into different types. And every type that is of equity and above appears on the balance sheet, and all the ones below equity appear on the P&L. So if we look at the P&L, we have individual contributions, corporate foundation grants. And if you look, here they all here in the chart of accounts, individual corporate foundation grants. So the chart of accounts is the most important list of all because it determines what these two financial statements look like. So it's really important that you set these things, this chart of accounts up so that you get what you want out of the software when you print out a P&L compared to budget. Uh, for the board. So um, I'm going to do two things here. One, I'm going to show you real quick how to create an account, um, also how to edit an account. If you go to your chart of accounts list and you don't like the name of an account or you want to change it like program fees, that looks pretty general, uh, I'm going to go to the bottom left-hand button after I've clicked on it, and I'm going to click Edit, and I'm going to change it. So I'll change it to what it really is. Uh, and this would be purely because that's what the board wants to see. They want to see the actual name of it so you don't get a board member asking, what does program fees mean? So, and now it's changed. And it changes it on all the previous transactions as well. Okay? And you see how this says program fees up here? When I click and refresh the report, it now changes it to workshop fees. So you can really see the relationship between the chart of accounts uh, and these two reports. Now, how to add an account. You go to the bottom left-hand button. You click New. And the first thing you've got to pick is the type. And the type, that is something that you may not know what the right type should be for your account. QuickBooks tries to give you some help. If I put Expense, it gives you a suggestion categorizes money spent in the normal course of operations, such as office supplies. gives you some examples. Okay? So say I want to create an expense account. This sounds good to me. I click Continue. And then uh, let's see, um, I'll create one for office supplies. And that's it. 
The rest of these fields that are on here are optional. I always say this. Some people have the type of personality where if there is a field, you feel like you have to put something in it. Otherwise, the world will cease to exist. Not true. Okay. All you need is the type and the account name, and that's all you need. Okay? If you don't know what the right type should be, talk to whoever it is that does your 990. Uh, that person knows, I promise you. And these types, they're fixed. You can't change what the types are. All right? So that's basically how to create an account. But what I really want to spend the next couple of minutes, a few minutes talking about, and then we'll take some questions, what should your chart of accounts look like? So I'm going to break it up into three topics or three areas. First, we're going to talk about what the balance sheet account should be. Okay? So let me just move this balance sheet over and kind of put it in the center of the screen. And you'll see, even if you didn't know the first thing about accounting, you probably realized that you needed to have a separate account for each one of your bank accounts. You'll need that. If you invoice customers, and most of you don't, but if say you're a membership association and you invoice out of QuickBooks, you'll need a receivable account. Another big one that most nonprofits need is one for furniture and equipment. Now this is a pretty small uh, organization, but they're big enough to where we have one for furniture and one for office equipment. If you're a really small group, you may just have one called furniture and equipment. If you're big, you may have a third one called building, a fourth one called land, a fifth one called leasehold improvements. It's up to you. Okay? Uh, liabilities, uh, everyone listening to me needs to have an account called Accounts Payable, every one of you. The good news is you all already do. QuickBooks gives that account to you when you set up your file. Okay? Uh, credit cards, if you use credit cards to buy things with, QuickBooks gives you the ability to set up an account just for the credit card. Some people don't use it. Some people just get the bill. They enter it. They pay it. They don't set up a separate card for it, uh, a separate account for it. But actually, it's more accurate if you set up an account for it because it allows you to enter the transactions separately or download the transactions from your credit card separately. So you may need that. Um, payroll. So Britta was asking about payroll before. If you are with an outside payroll company uh, and it's not QuickBooks that you're using, some other company does it, and then you just try and figure out how to enter the transactions, which we'll talk about how to do that in our three-day webinar. But um, you want to have one account called Payroll Liabilities. That's all you need, one account called Payroll Liabilities. If, however, you're using QuickBooks to do your payroll, and just so you understand, that means you're going over here to Employees, and you're clicking Pay Employees. You're doing it from these screens here. Let me see if mine's open. Um, yeah, and you do it from this screen. If this looks familiar to you, then you're using QuickBooks to do your payroll. And if that's you, what I would suggest is you set up separate sub-accounts for each one of the payroll liabilities that makes finding and fixing problems easier later. You'll need to have an account for any loans you have. It looks like we have one loan here with a bank. The equity section, don't worry about it. Leave it alone. You don't need any special accounts uh, there. Uh, nonprofits are supposed to have these special equity accounts, but it's only for reporting purposes at the very end of the year, and QuickBooks doesn't track that stuff anyway. So I just tell nonprofits, just leave the equity section alone. If you're a CPA and you're listening to me, I know you're surprised, but QuickBooks doesn't track the different types of equity accounts. So I just leave it where it is. Now, uh, that's your balance sheet. People don't mess the balance sheet up too much. They mess the P&L up something awful. All right. So here's my theme for you. Okay? This is my, my uh, ideal situation for you guys. I want you to be able to give the board a P&L compared to budget that they will actually read. In order to do that, it, can, it must fit on one page. Okay? If it's six or seven pages, they're not going to read it. And if they don't read it, they won't know what's going on with the finances. And that's not good because if something happens, they'll be blaming you for not telling them. So you want your board to be happy. And in order to make them happy, 
and you need to give them a piece of paper they can understand. So I need it to be one page long. What that means is that when it comes to your income and expense accounts, you don't want to have very many. All right? Because if you have a lot, you're in trouble. And I know a lot of you that are listening to me, you have a ton of accounts on your P&L. Because every day somebody runs into your office and says, I need you to track this. And then you go, uh, and then you enter an account for it. Uh, and that's probably what your predecessor did as well. So you end up with 50 million accounts. So the best way to show you the right way to set up your income and expense accounts is to show you what the wrong way is. So I'm going to um, go to a data file that is wrong. Uh, and to me, that's the best way of showing you what the right way to do this is. First, we're going to show you uh, income accounts, and then we'll show you the expense accounts. Sorry that it's taking so long here. But do you see I'm in a different data file? And do you see how the color is different? So it's real easy to tell when you're in a different data file. It's kind of cool. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to pull up a P&L. And this is the wrong way of doing it. Okay? So if you're not listening to me and you're looking at the screen, you see wrong way. All right? Here's what you shouldn't do. Restricted grants. Okay? If you have restricted grants, say uh, restricted. Type restricted in the chat. I want to see how many of you get grants that are restricted for some purpose. Just type away. I'm sure there's a ton of them. Becky, are we seeing a ton of them? I'm assuming there would be. Restricted yep, lots and lots of them. Yeah. Now, many, 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 many. It's just now I'm going to ask you. Like I'm going to ask you a question, guys. What is the most important thing you need to know about a restricted grant? What do you have to tell the funder at the end of the grant period? Go ahead and type an answer. What do you have to tell the funder at the end of a grant period for a restricted grant? What do you got to tell the funder? What they say? We have we have some people asking what is a restricted grant? It's, it's a grant, grant that's that has to be spent <laughs> on a specific program or for a specific purpose. Right. It can't. It's not. You can't just spend it how you want to. You have to spend it on a restricted for a restricted purpose. Okay. Right. Um, so people are responding. You have to be able to tell them where the money was spent exactly. and, and how you allocated funding. Exactly. How the money was spent. Now what you really want is a little P&L for the restricted grant. And we're going to show you that in the, the three-day webinar. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put an income account called restricted grants. All that tells us is what we got in restricted grants. It doesn't tell us how the money was spent, so it's not really helpful. And it also makes uh, entering the transactions pretty tough because if I get a restricted grant from a foundation, I don't know whether to enter it down here on the foundation grant line or up here in the restricted grant line. So that's a problem. So don't do that. Okay? <laughs> the other thing is you see the second one, the Green Truth Grant, and then the United Fund Grant? This is the person who's decided to create an income account for every single grant they have. Not good. Okay? Don't do that. It makes your chart of accounts huge. Now I know that you guys need to track restricted grants, and you need to understand who your grantors are. We don't need to use the chart of accounts list for that. We're going to use the customer list for that. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about the customer list in a minute, and then we'll talk about restricted grants uh, when we do the three-day webinar, uh, which is in August. All right. So what I suggest that you do, and let me go ahead and Make this a little smaller again. All right. And then I'm going to make this a little bit. All right. Okay, I'm trying to go slow with the mouse moving here. So every single one of you that's listening to me should have these same four accounts individual contributions, corporate, foundation, government grants. Why? Because that's how I have to report it on your 990. That's how I have to report it on a financial statement audit if you get one. Uh, and that is a really good way for your board to understand where your money is coming from. Understand, these people on the board, most of them don't know very much about numbers. That's why we're getting them a one-pager. But to see that we get most of our money from foundations and individuals, we don't get very much for government grants, that's something anybody can understand. Okay? And it's a helpful piece of information. Maybe there's an opportunity missed here. Or maybe there's not. Maybe there's not a lot of government grants for your nonprofit. But 
uh, that are available for your nonprofit. But the point is it spurs discussion during a board meeting, which is a good thing. If a board member is interested, they're happier. All right? So uh, then that, those four are what some people call unearned income because they're kind of given to you. Now, I know you work for them, particularly restricted grants, but um, they're still kind of given to you. Whereas many of you do fees. You have fees for services. If you're a membership association, you have membership dues, so I created one there. I have a generic one called program fees. Again, I would probably advocate changing it to whatever it is you do. Ticket sales if you're a theater, uh, workshops if you're, again, you know, putting on workshops for people, uh, sponsorship income, whatever the type of income is. All right? Uh, but again, Greg? Yes? Sorry, can I jump in and just ask that you repeat the four sections again that you just mentioned? Sure. They're on the screen. They're on the screen. Individual contributions, corporate grants, foundation grants, and government grants. Those are the four what they call unearned incomes. And that's how I have to see it in order to do your 990. Okay? So we don't have very much income account. Now another thing is if you're a membership association, type membership. I want to see there's probably a ton of membership associations here. You guys that have members, many times you'll have different levels of members. We have the, uh, the uh, lifetime member or the affiliate member, and then we have the regular member, and then we have the corporate member. And, they, and it's very important that nonprofits see what, how many they have of each type of member. But don't set up income accounts for those. We're going to use another list for that okay? called the items list. So this you just have regular membership dues, and that's it. So it's easy. It fits on one page. People can understand it. Okay? So I'm going to move on to the expenses, and then we'll take some questions. Expenses, I'm hiding them from you. Now when it comes to expenses, I want you to forget about nonprofits for a minute. Just think about regular businesses that are out there. You know, a doctor, a guy owns a pizza place, whatever. Um, the only thing that really needs to be tracked for regular businesses, for-profit businesses, is what I call the natural category of what the expense is. Okay? When you're entering checks and bills and you're a regular business, we need to know, was it salaries? Was it travel? Was it rent? Was it supplies? Was it equipment rental? Was it postage? Was it photography? These are like the normal generic ways of thinking about expenses. That's why it's called the natural category. And that's all that regular for-profit businesses have to worry about for the most part. Nonprofits have to worry about it too. And listen to me. Every time you enter an expense on a check or a bill, I need to know what the natural category was. Okay? But there's a second thing that nonprofits have to track. Every time they enter expense, nonprofits have to put it in one of three buckets. What are those three buckets? Can somebody tell me or chat me up that usually you want most of your money to be spent in bucket one instead of bucket two or bucket three? What are those three buckets? Somebody chat me up and, and Becky will tell me. Sure. We're waiting for some responses to come in. And Greg, I just wanted to mention a couple of people have highlighted that you're still showing the wrong way. Um, transactions I know. on your screen. I am. You know? Okay. I am. We weren't sure if you were wanting to show no, that. No, so. I haven't switched it. Thank um, you, so though. I appreciate that. Program and program is admin one. and fundraising. Ding, 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 ding. So program, admin, and fundraising. Every single time we enter an expense, not only do you got to tell QuickBooks whether it's um, supplies, travel, whatever the natural categories. You also got to tell it whether it's program, admin, or fundraising. And the reason why is because funders care about that. Um, if I am going to give money to your organization and I look at your 990, which by the way, I can see every one of your 990s. It's online at a website called GuideStar. If most of your expenses are program expenses, then I'm more likely to give you money. If I look at your your your, um, your tax return, and it looks like most of your expenses are in the admin button, then it's like or the admin bucket. Why would I give you money? You spend most of your money on admin and overhead. I want my money to go to help the kids or whatever the mission is. So as a matter of fact, United Way, don't quote me on this even though it's being recorded, <laughs> but um, I believe that if you want a grant from United Way, your program expenses need to be at least 75% of your total. 
Okay? So here's what people do that's wrong. Okay, this is still wrong. What they will do is they will create expense accounts for their programs. So here's one. This organization is called Synergy now, and it's all about environmentally friendly forms of energy. We have the Guidance Center. That's one program that they have. They have an annual conference, and then they have something called the Aware Campaign, which is kind of like PSAs and stuff like that, uh, and uh, some lobbying. So they've set up expense accounts because somebody ran into the office and said, I need to know how much uh, the Synergy Conference is. And so, oh, okay, I'll set up an account for it. This is wrong. Okay? Because what happens is, first of all, um, the only the real obvious expenses for the programs go here. The biggest expense of your organization is salaries. And invariably, everybody seems to understand that salaries need to be on their own line. But the salaries need to be allocated, Britta knows this, uh, between the different programs. And people don't do it. So it ends up looking like you didn't spend very much money on your programs. The other thing is it makes entering transactions complicated. Because if I, get, if I write a check for postage for the Synergy Conference, I don't know whether to put it to the Synergy Conference or put it down here to postage. And if I'm your accountant, I need both pieces of information. So that's not going to work. So when it comes to your expenses, do not use the chart of accounts for your different programs. Okay? And you see this one that says fundraising expenses? I know that 90% of you have this account. Get rid of it. I don't want it. Okay? If you put something here, I've got to go in and figure out if I'm doing your tax return, well, what is it? Is it printing? Is it postage? And then I've got to move it to where it needs to go. So when it comes to your expenses, what you want to do – let me hide these – you want to save your expense accounts for the natural category only. Salaries and wages, health insurance, rent, postage, printing. And there's no right answer here because you may want more details than other people do. Some people just have one called professional fees. We have one called accounting and another called consulting because somebody on the board wanted that detail. The point is these are natural categories. Another way of thinking about them is they're generic. We all have postage. We all have printing. I should look at your expenses on your chart of accounts list and not have a clue what your organization does. Okay? So where are we going to track program admin and fundraising if we're not using the chart of accounts list for it? What list are we going to use? And uh, you guys can chat me up and give me an answer. What list do you use to track your programs in QuickBooks? Does anyone know? Class. Class codes, classes? Yes. Classes is the answer. Right. So classes is a separate list in QuickBooks. To get to the class list, you go up to lists, and you click class list right there. And you'll see your different classes. Now, every single person listening to me should have at least three classes. You're going to have one called fundraising, one called admin, and you'll have a third one for your program. Now in this case we have three programs, so we have three of them. To set up a class, it's very simple. You just go to the bottom left-hand button. You click New. You name your class, New Class. And we click OK, and now we've got a class. Now you've bought yourself a little extra work because now when you're entering transactions, I'll go to the right check window that we went to before. Not only do you got to put the natural category, which we'll put postage, but additionally, you can point it to a class, Synergy Conference. And yes, some transactions get split between different programs. And here's where we would go to put the rest of it. Okay? Now, I would not suggest using this to track grants, guys. If you have grants that are restricted, we use the customer job field to track that, and we'll point that out during the three-day that we're doing. Okay? So here's the thing. Every time you enter a transaction, a check, a bill, a deposit, what have you, you point it to an account, and you point it to a program or admin or fundraising. The benefit is, and this is my big finish, 
reports, company and financial, profit and loss by class. When I click it, look at how beautiful this is. What we have here is we have columns. And I'm going to go here. Look at the expenses. Actually, let me collapse to get rid of the sub-accounts. Um, if you look at the expenses, you can see the Guidance Center cost $119,000. The Synergy Conference cost $48,000. The Aware Campaign is $10,000. Admin is $55,000. Fundraising is $20,000. The way the expenses are broken out here is beautiful. And it makes things real easy for me when I go to do your 990. Okay? As a matter of fact, I think I have, if I'm not mistaken, let me see. I believe I have the 990 uh, pulled up here. There it is. Welcome to the wonderful world of a tax return for a nonprofit. <laughs> but let me just show you here. I'm going to scroll down. This return is such a nightmare, by the way. But uh, I don't know if any of you do these things, but they're quite the ordeal. But uh, I'm going to go down to where the expenses are. And if you look at the expenses, so this is called Statement of Functional Expenses. Okay, it's on page 10. But if you look, do you see we have a column for Program, a column for Management in General or Admin, and a column for Fundraising. And then we have a total. And then the rows are going to be the types of accounts. Accounting, legal, there's IT, office expenses, advertising. These are your natural categories. Okay? On an audit, if you guys get a financial statement audit, I have to do this. Okay? This is a statement of functional expenses, and it has the natural categories across this, uh, as rows, and then again, program, management, fundraising, and the total. So that's why I want you to be able to give me this. But in addition, it's good for you. Because not only can you see at any given moment how much a program is costing, but you can also see whether a program is paying for itself. Because if you have any revenue that's related to a program, like all these grants we got for the Guidance Center, I pointed them to the Guidance Center, and I can see whether the Guidance Center is paying for itself. And indeed, it's not. It's lost 14000 whereas the Synergy Conference has made 7900 This isn't something you would give the board. You might give it up to a finance committee, but you'll definitely give it to me so I can do your 990 and your audit, and you should look at it throughout the year because it gives you a great picture of the different programs that you're running. So um, I'll take a couple of questions here. I'm quite sure we have a ton of them. And then we'll move on to budgets, and then we'll finish up. So uh, talk to me. What do you got? So we have a couple of people who are still pretty confused about the difference between accounts and classes. So can you explain what, why those are different and what the differences are when okay. you use them? All right. So an account is is the natural category of the transaction. And when I say the natural category is what kind of income account is it or what kind of expense is it? And specifically with expenses, when I say the natural category, it's the object of the expense. It's, is it rent? Is it postage? Is it printing? Those are your accounts. It's the natural way of thinking about an expense. All right. Whereas a program, that doesn't have anything to do with the natural type of account. That is, what are you doing in your nonprofit? If you're a theater, maybe you have five shows a year. Each show is a program, and you're going to want a P&L for it. And that's what a class is for. It allows you to point transactions to the program, both income and expense. So as you can see on your screen here, you get a nice little P&L for the program. All right. So I don't know if that answers the question, um, but that's uh, as far as I can go at this point. Think of classes as departments. So it's like a little P&L for a department. But it's not what the expense is. It's what program is it serving. That's what the classes are for. Anybody, anything else? We'll take another. Sure. Well, we also had a question which I imagine we may have other people here joining us from churches. And they were asking about, 
do the categories of admin, fundraising, and programs also apply to churches in the way that they uh, you know, handle money? No. Does that no. apply to you? This doesn't have nothing to do with a church. Okay? If you are a church, this is not what I want you to do. Okay? Churches don't have programs, admin, and fundraising. Churches don't fill out a 990. Churches don't fill out um, an audit usually. They don't do, get an audit usually. So they don't really report to anybody but their elders, and they usually run by committee or ministry. So do not use classes at all for that if you are a church. And I'm going to, I think I can show you a church real quick, and I'll show you what the appropriate setup is for a church. Uh, and let me go ahead and select that one, and it will open up. So you don't use classes for that. What you're going to need to use is your various committees. Those are your accounts. And then your, um, so if you have a worship committee, that would be an expense account. And then you're going to use sub-accounts for the natural category of expenses under that committee, travel, supplies. Um, sorry about this. This is going to take a second here. And what that does is that allows for you to use classes to track your funds. And that's how churches use classes to track funds. And uh, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar, but that's something that I can certainly help you with. Uh, and we can talk about it through a tech support agreement. I'm having trouble getting uh, this data file to open up. Let's move on to the next question while I'm still trying to work. Um, <clears throat> we'll take one more. Sure. We had some questions about how to track expenses uh, when you're doing a fundraising campaign or a fundraising event. How would so, you yeah. track expenses for that? So this is really interesting, and we're going to cover this in the three-day webinar, but let me just tell you that expenses for a fundraising event do not get put with the rest of expenses. They actually get netted against the income up in the income section. That's the appropriate treatment. So I'll show you when we uh, do the three-day webinar that we have um, separate accounts that are set up as income type accounts even though you put expenses to them so that you can get a little mini P&L for the event in the body of the main P&L. Um, you don't put those expenses down with the rest of them. Here's what a church looks like. I realize that wasn't a complete answer, but I'm going to need to uh, – I don't have the time to give you the whole answer that I want to give you. But do you see what we do with a church here? We have an account called Pastoral Committee with subs underneath it. We have one for Worship Committee with the subs, music supplies, music equipment. This is how you want to set up your, classes, your, uh, your accounts in a church. All right? So I need to move because we only have we have like 20 something minutes left, and I need to teach budgets and one other thing. So let me go and show you how to enter a budget in QuickBooks. And you know the thing about budgets is every nonprofit needs to report that P&L compared to a budget. But it's amazing to me how few actually use the QuickBooks budget. So let me just show you where to enter your budget. You go to Company. You go to Planning and Budgeting, and you go to Set Up Budgets. Okay? So we'll click on that. And uh, the first time you go in here, this is the screen that you'll be looking at. And it's going to say, all right, you want to do a budget. What year do you want to do a budget for? When you first set up QuickBooks, it asks you what your fiscal year is. And this company, this Synergy Now, we end our year on June 30. So that's why these date ranges look like this. Okay? So we say we want to do a budget for the year of 2020-21. We'll click P&L or Balance Sheet. Few people do a budget for a balance sheet. Usually do a P&L uh, budget. We click Next. We click Next again. And then there's a couple of ways to do the budget. You can either do a budget from scratch, which lets you manually enter the numbers, or this is kind of cool. You could do a budget from previous year's actual data which is kind of neat. Then your screen starts with what the actual numbers were for the prior year, and you can just change them for the next year. It's a good starting point. I'm going to click Create a Budget from Scratch. I'll click Finish. These words here, these are our accounts, came from the Chart of Accounts list. 
And you'll notice here there are 13 columns here, one for each month, and then we have an annual total column. Now, the reason why there's one for each month is because they assume that you budget by month. If you budget by month, let me know. Chat up, I budget by month. And I'll show you what it means. It means people that budget by month are doing this. Well, I get 4,000 in in July. Uh, I usually get 5,000 in donations in August, September. It starts going up. Who does that? Who enters the budget by month? Do we have people doing it? Yep, we do. Jan, Susan, Maura, Carol, yeah. lots of it's, people. Are it's invested. probably yeah, going to be about 10% of all of you. Okay, most people don't, and the reason why is because we're naturally lazy. Okay, we don't want to type in all these numbers. But there's advantages uh, to budgeting by month, and we'll point it out. Uh, well, I'll tell you, if you budget by month then when you look at a July and August actual to budget, you can compare July and August actual to July and August budget. So you're really comparing what you thought you were going to get to the two months to what you really did. Uh, whereas if you just budget by year, then you can't really see that. You just kind of see how well you did compared to the whole year. Um, but let me make this a little easier for you guys that budget by month. These two buttons down here, Copy Across and Adjust Row Amounts, these are your friends. All right? So look at Rent. That's something where it's the same number every single month. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type it in the first month. I'm going to click Copy Across, and boom, it saved me typing it 11 times. Now I know some of you wish that we could type in this annual total and it would automatically divide it. and I appreciate that you want that to happen, but it's not going to happen. Okay, this is grayed out. You could push it until the cows come home. It's not going to happen. Okay. The other thing that's really cool that most people don't know about is this adjust row amounts. Now look at electricity. So it's really hot now in Atlanta. $650 will be my electric bill, which is actually insane. Uh, August, it's even hotter in August. And then it starts to go down. Well, rather than trying to figure it out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this one, click Adjust Row Amounts. I'm going to say of the currently selected month, decrease it by, and I'll put a percentage. I'll say eh, it goes down 5% a month. Okay? I'll click, I click OK, and look what it did. Isn't that cool? So that kind of saves you time. And it's really great if you budget by month because, again, then you can compare your actuals for the year to date to your budget for the year to date. Most people don't do that. Most people budget by year. Now if you budget by year, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put your entire budget in one of these 12 columns. Now the column you want to pick is the first column of the year, which is what I did with the 1920 budget. I put the whole budget in the first month of the year, not the last. You put it in the first month of the year, and then it will automatically copy to the annual total. So that's where you would put your budget. All right? Now, after you're done putting the budget in, we click Reports. Company and Finance – well, no. Any report that has a budget in it, you go to Budgets, and a Budget Overview, and it asks what budget you want to look at by year. I'm looking at the 1920 budget. I'll click Next, Next and finish. Now this budget has numbers in every column, which would be helpful if you budgeted by month. But since we budget by year, you want to just make it total only. And then we've got our budget that we can print this out, add it as an appendix to the board meeting, uh, and they can review the budget and they can approve it. Okay? Then obviously you enter transactions, pointing them to these accounts. And then when you want to look at a budget to actual, reports, Budgets and Forecasts, Budget to Actual. You pick the budget you want to compare the actuals to, 1920. We click Next. We click Next. And we click Finish. Now the first time you look at this report, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to have a lot of columns because it's going to have July's actual, July's budget, and then the variance, and then August's actual, August budget, and then the variance and then September's actual. So 
that's four columns a month. Twelve months, that's 36 columns. Plus you got a total all the way over on the end. So what instead I do is I change the show columns to total only. And now we've got the actuals for the year, the budget for the year, and the variance. Now I'm going to collapse this. And this is the one pager that I want to give to the Board of Directors. Not the Finance Committee, but the overall board. Now, here's the one thing I want to point out. If you're budgeting by year, and this, has, this is why it is it's better to budget by month if you can help it. If you budget by year, well, we're at the end of the year. So this is the entire year's actual and the entire year's budget. So we're comparing apples to apples. But that only happens once a year. Most of the time when we're doing reports for the board, we're in the middle of the year. So say three months has gone by, July 1 through September 30. I'll click Refresh. We look at this thing, and it's like it gives me July, August, and September's actual. QuickBooks thinks it's giving me July, August, and September's budget, but it's not. It's actually giving me the annual budget because I put it the annual budget in July. And here's the reason why when you budget by year, this report's not as valuable. Look at this thing. Now, we've gotten in 4,900 out of 55,000. Is that good or bad? What's your knee-jerk reaction? Three months has gone by. We've gotten in 4,900. That's 8%. Is that good or bad? What do you say, Becky? Or what do they say? I'm waiting for the responses to come in. We are typing seriously to try and answer questions. Let's see. Bad, 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 yeah, bad, 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 and bad. The reason, and the reason why is because three months has gone by. So you would think we would have gotten 25% in. Now, this is July, August, and September. We don't get most of our donations during that time, right guys? We get it during Christmas. So, but all things being equal, that's how your board is going to think. Not because they're not intelligent, but because if you're budgeting by year, they have no way of knowing how good or bad it is, so they just assume that we get in our donations equally all year. So anything that's more or less than 25% here by a lot, you're going to get a question from the board. So those of you that budget by year, what I do is I send this report to Excel. And uh, you can send reports to Excel. It's been very easy to do for years in QuickBooks. You don't even have to have Excel open. You just have to push that Excel button. It opens it up in Excel. And then I'm going to change it, and I'm going to type annual budget here because that's what it is. And then I'm going to put that percentage right here, 25%, because that's what everybody's thinking. And then I can put a note next to the one that the variance is different. Here, give me a break. Wait till. Xmas. Okay, that's when all the money comes in. Got it? So that's the budgets. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is take a couple of questions on this. The income thing I'm just going to show you real quick, and then we'll spend the rest of the time for questions, and I'll, and I'll stay late for you as well. Um, so and I've got to show a little bit on the back end too, Greg, so we need to okay. leave a couple of minutes to do that. Okay. Um, We've got lots of questions in the queue. Um, one person, actually not just one person, but many people have asked whether there is a sample chart of accounts that we could share out. Do you have anything like that that we could attach as a follow-up so people could see what I'll a typical I'll nonprofit? You, I'll, David, if you could just make a note, we'll send out something. I hesitate to do it because there's always exceptions for every single nonprofit, but I can send out a generic one. Sure, I can do that. Okay, um, that would be terrific. We also have asked, uh, people asking, how do you delete from the chart of accounts? Uh, we've had a number of people sure. asking how to if fix you go it to or change it or wipe it clean. List. And when you, so you know, to delete an account if you decide that you don't want it, you can click on it, go to the bottom left-hand button, and click Delete. Are you sure? It will delete. The only thing is, is that if it's ever been used in a transaction, you can't delete it. Because the, the check that you wrote for postage is pointed to postage. If you deleted the postage account, then the check would freak out. It wouldn't know where to go to, and then your computer would blow up. 
So if you go to delete something that's already in here, if it's been used in a transaction, it will give you this message. It will say you can't delete it because it's been used or has a balance, but you can make it inactive. Now when you make it inactive, it hides it which means you can't see it when you enter new transactions. So that's cool for people that have been trying to clean up their books. But it will still show on reports because old transactions are pointed to it. So I want you to look at postage. Look at how postage is here with rent on top of it and printing underneath. I'll click Make an Active. It's gone. But it's still on this report because there's been transactions pointed to it. But if you tried to point a check to it, we go down here and we try to find postage, we won't be able to find it. It's not here because it's been inactivated. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do real quick uh, the income thing, and then we'll spend the rest of the time, and I'll go over a few minutes, and uh, we'll spend the rest of the time on questions. And uh, I'm going to open up uh, another data file for this. And basically what I'm going to be teaching you is the different ways of entering your income. Okay? People don't have a lot of problem with entering expenses. You either enter a check or enter a bill. But entering income gets complicated. So we're talking about all the income that you enter. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do it. One way is when, min when money comes in, you can go directly to the Record Deposit window, and you can enter it here. The other way, is to use what QuickBooks calls a sales receipt. Those of you with QuickBooks for the Mac, QuickBooks Pro, it's called a sales receipt. Those of you that have the Nonprofit Edition, they change the word to donation, but when you click it, it's still a sales receipt. So if you want to use QuickBooks as a donor database, you want to use this sales receipt form. If you have another database that you're using, uh, there's umpteen millions of them, Donor Perfect, Salesforce, what have you. Then you enter them using the Record Deposit window. Okay? And the thing that I'll end with is the reason why this is so cool if you use this to enter your donations is if you do this, look what you can get. When I print this, I can print this and send it to the donor. Now it doesn't look very nice. It's not something I'd want to send to the donor. But what you can do is I can change the way the form looks to a thank you letter, and then it looks like this. So I have tons of nonprofits using QuickBooks as a donor database. They use the sales receipt instead of the Make Deposit window. It still gets the income in. Now, Unfortunately, I don't have time to teach the whole process, but not only do they get a sales receipt uh, that you can turn into a thank you letter, you can even email it to the donor, but you also get all these really great donor history reports. I'm going to go to Sales, Sales by Customer Summary. This report is a report that you can get only if you use the sales receipt. And this is just for the month. I'll make it all dates and I can change the columns to where they'll be by year. And I like doing this because I can very easily see, and I'll zoom in here, Chad and Marie Brown, they've given every year except this year they haven't given. We need to call them. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of fancy smancy donor databases out there. I don't see this kind of report in it, and this report's awesome. QuickBooks is a really pretty impressive donor database. You just got to know how to use it. And again, in order to get it, you got to use this sales receipt. Okay? So we've got just a few minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let me see. I'm going to switch back to the slides. We're going to talk for a couple minutes and then it's question time. All right? So let me um, let me return to the slides here. Uh, we are questions time all the time here. So for yeah, those of you on the I back know. end, you're aware we've been answering nonstop. Um, one question we want to ask you though, our audience, is whether you would like to receive the QuickBooks Made Easy 
newsletter which has is it monthly, Greg? And it includes it's a monthly tips on news, using newsletter, and it's believe me, it's a nice little it's an emailed newsletter that gives you a little QuickBooks tip that's actually a little video, and uh, and and then it just kind of tells you where we're going to be. It's a one pager. It's real easy peasy. We're not going to be bothering you, and most everybody wants it, but I just wanted to make sure to get a, a okay from you. So go ahead and put yes if you want to do it, no if you don't. Uh, and then there's one more thing that I need to uh, talk to you about, and that is the webinar, um, I want to be able to keep teaching you. And so we've got uh, the, uh, a three-day webinar. It's two hours a day. It's August uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th for two hours in the, in the middle of the day. And um, it's normally, I think, 200. You guys can get it for 149. Uh, and additionally, I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip over. Can I go ahead and skip to that slide? Becky? Sure. If we, if we close out the poll though, other people won't be able to subscribe. So okay. I just wanted to leave it up for a few seconds. Yeah, we'll leave it more, up for a few more seconds. If you haven't answered yet, take that second to do that, and then we'll show those yeah. coupon codes again for both uh, those the, of you that aren't the webinars. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Come for back the to the computer. <laughs> So you can get coupon codes directly from QuickBooks Made Easy and Greg uh, to have tech support available to you for the next year to help you walk through your own setup. I'm going to uh, go ahead. Some of the questions on the back end are very specific, and it seems like they would really benefit from having that one-on-one -on -one, uh, tech support. So yeah, let me just we'll go the, ahead and show uh, the codes at this point. Are you? Did you? Okay, there we go. So these are the codes. So if you there's a couple of ways to learn. You know, if you're learning here but you feel like, you know what, we needed more time, we're going to give you all the time you want. And that the webinar won't be we're not going to have hundreds of people like you normally would have. So actually, I'm sorry. It looks like I got the date wrong. It's the 9th, 10th and 11th. David, you want to make sure that's the right date. But what you do is you go to QuickBooks Made Easy and you put in this code, TSW50OFF. So then it will be only $149, and, uh, and you'll be able to sign up for that webinar. You go to QuickBooksMadeEasy.com. Uh, and then if you'd rather just say, you know what, you know what, Greg, I just want to talk to you. One year of tech support, and you're going to either be talking to me or Jennifer for an entire year. It's $300. We're giving it to you for $149. You go to the website, QuickBooks Made Easy, TSTS150. That's the code. Uh, now this is good for 48 hours, these codes, because this is really, really cheap. And um, so we're only doing it for 48 hours so people don't go crazy. Uh, so you have till Thursday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. So if you're on the West Coast, you have till 9 p.m. So that basically gives you the rest of the day today and all day Wednesday and all day Thursday to sign up for this thing. And you can sign up for both. Um, and I think that's it. So now what I want to do, did you want to do questions first? Yep, actually, wanna... before, we, before we dive back into questions, I just I'd mentioned earlier that I would quickly show the donation programs, where to get those. Uh, you can access the Intuit donations if you're looking for the latest version of QuickBooks. Right now we have QuickBooks 2016. We expect that the newer version of that will launch maybe sometime this fall. So if you're not sure when you need it and you think you won't need it for a few more months, you may want to wait until the newer version is out. You can get that one user license, the three user license, QuickBooks for Mac users, or QuickBooks Online subscription. And you can do that by going to TechSoup's website, browse by donor or provider, and click on Intuit. You can also access uh, Greg's QuickBooks Made Easy trainings by clicking down here on QuickBooks Made Easy to find that training essentials DVD uh, and book set. Uh, and that will take you, when you click on the Intuit page, it takes you to the product pages where you can read about the different editions and options available to you. And I just wanted to show some additional resources. Uh, if you're on an older version, we do have webinars on 2016, 2015, 2014, 2013, 2012. So if you're using an older version, I'd recommend following these links, which you can't click on right now, but you will get this in the follow-up email. And it was attached in the final reminder and confirmation emails this morning. So um, feel free to check out those resources. Now let's get back to questions. We right. have many, many So what I'm going to do, 
Uh, there was a few people that wanted to know. Somebody wanted the code again, and uh, I'll just pop the code up again. And the tech support covers everything. Somebody wanted to know if it like if they could review their chart of accounts. Somebody wanted to know if the tech support starts immediately. It does, unless you want to delay it. You can tell us uh, that you want it delayed, and we'll start it later if you want to. Uh, and I think, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back over uh, to – I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to switch back over to QuickBooks, and I am all yours. So, And you guys, just hang out and listen. You're going to learn. So uh, go for it. What do we got? Great. Well, um, a lot of people were really excited about creating that thank you letter and the sales receipt template. And I know you said you can't show the details of how to do all of that, but where do you find the sales receipt? So if you so can show one more time where that's even found. Okay. So the sales receipt. If you are in the Mac version of QuickBooks, uh, then, or you're in the, um, the Pro version, the home page will have it. And if you don't see your home page, just click on Home right here, and the home page will pop up. And then you're going to see a little button here that says Sales Receipt. Okay? If you have the Nonprofit Edition, it says Donations. You click here. This is where you go to do it. Now, these things are templates. They're transactions, but they're also little templates. And you see how you have all these template choices? You all, we, all of you have one that says Custom Sales Receipt. So what I'll show you, and I'll show you this in the webinar, you go to Lists, Templates. Here's your Templates list. And what I've done is I've created my own template. I created it myself. And I played with it. Here's the Layout Designer where you add stuff and get rid of stuff. All right. So um, I can help you with that with the tech support. It's really awesome. It really is. What's the next question? We had um, a couple of people asking, is the webinar series just for the desktop version, or is there an online version too? And so There's I an online to version as well. There is an online version 3-day webinar series as well, not on the same dates, different dates. Um, and so on Thursday during our webinar on the online edition, we'll be sharing uh, you know, the details about that 3-day series, and uh, I believe you plan to offer a coupon code for that series too. Yeah. So join us for that event. MadeEasy.com, that's where you would go. And you click on Live Seminars. And then if you go down, and here's all of our live seminars. Here's the webinars. This is the one for the desktop, 9, 10, and 11. This is the one for the online the following week, 16, 17, and 18. And you just click on Find Out More, and that's where you go to sign up for it. And that's where the coupon code is, where you put the coupon code. Um, next question. Great. So we have people asking about payroll and how to handle payroll in QuickBooks if you don't actually purchase the payroll uh, program through into it. Yeah, and unfortunately we don't have the payroll donation as part of our or we don't have a payroll service as a donation through into it. We we keep trying to get it and we'll keep working on them and hopefully someday we'll get it. But for now the payroll service is a separate purchase directly through QuickBooks. If you don't have that, is there a way to manage payroll in QuickBooks? Well, okay, so if you don't have payroll through QuickBooks, you'll need to go to an outside payroll source, one of the payroll companies that exists out there, ADP, Paychex, IOI. There's all kinds of CompuPay. There's SurePay. There's all kinds of companies out there. The thing that I need you to understand is that your payroll needs to be split between program admin and fundraising. Those are your departments. Most of these payroll companies have departmental reporting. So you basically give them your class list, tell them those are your departments, and then you enter the payroll by department. So basically, and I mean, again, I, I'll, I'll teach this at the webinar, but you have three drafts that occur when you run payroll from an outside payroll source. One is the net paychecks, one is the taxes, and one is the fee. Well, the taxes and the net paychecks need to be split. You can either use a journal entry. I enter it in the right check window. And then I use the class to point it to the different classes. And what happens is you tell the payroll company what your departments are and who gets put to what department. John is 100% Guidance Center. Jane is 50% Guidance Center. 50% is Aware Campaign. And you may have 20 employees. 
and then you enter the draft in the right check window, pointing it to the different classes. And you don't enter the draft for each check. You just do one draft for all the paychecks. And you, you can pull departmental reports that will give you the draft organized by department rather than employee. So I just create like a make-believe employee called All Employees. I just create that. And then I use that to enter my payroll. So, and I enter it broken out by class. And Britta would also want it broken out by grant, which is over here. Next question. Sorry, just getting myself unmuted here. Um, let's see, we have uh, many questions about in-kind donations. And I know you said you couldn't cover that in depth, but uh, can you give a teaser of how people should manage sure. in-kind donations? Sure, sure. So an in-kind donation is basically where somebody gives you anything other than money. They give you stuff, or they give you services that are donated. Now, there's not really a button that says in-kind. So I'm going to give you some bad news. The best way to enter an in-kind donation is to do a journal entry. So I'm going to go to Company, and I'm going to go to Make General Journal Entry. This is where you would go to do it. And we'll talk more about this at the webinar. But you create an income account called In-Kind Contributions. If you want to make an income, an income account go up, you credit it for whatever the value is of the stuff that you got. Say we got somebody donated a computer that was valued at $500. And then what you you for the other line, because every transaction has to hit at least two accounts, is you put whatever the account is that you would have chosen had you written a check for it. I meant this to say in kind contributions, not individual. In kind contributions. All right. That's an income account. So you set that up as an income account. And then the debit goes to whatever account you would have chosen had you written a check for it. This one will put to computers and other hardware. That's how you enter an in-kind contribution using a journal entry. There's more about it, but that's it for now. Next question. Let's see. We have a lot of people who asked about um, just clarification on the on the webinar series really quickly, and sure. whether or not multiple people can attend it from an organization with the one code, or is it just one login? How does that work? Well, it will be one screen. Now, I don't know if David's still on the line. I'm thinking yeah, I'm still, we, how do we, we usually just allow one organization to sign up, and they could have multiple people join. We don't, we don't limit them. Okay. All right. So that's cool. Yeah. Great. And you know what? We are actually at 7 minutes over time, and I want to be respectful of the fact that people may have other things to get off to. We've answered more than 220 questions on the back end already, and I know that there are many, many outstanding questions, but I would recommend um, you know, checking out the different offers that QuickBooks Made Easy has made available, including their tech support. If you have a lot of detailed uh, questions that are very specific to your organization. This I think is a really great option to get your questions answered. Um, and then the QuickBooks Made Easy 3-day series again uh, I think is another opportunity for you to learn how to get this all set up the right way and get questions answered. Talk to Greg, talk to David, and the other people on the back end here today, Carol and Jennifer who are helping seriously answer questions. Um, I want to go ahead and invite you to chat in one thing that you've learned today that you are going to take back and try and implement as your own organization. I'd also like to invite you to share this webinar and the content you've learned and, and received with any other colleagues that may benefit from it. And lastly, I would ask that you please complete that post-event survey that will pop up once our webinar ends so that we can continue to improve our program. Um, I mentioned this already, and we've chatted out the link a few times. You'll get this in the follow-up email as well. But Thursday's webinar will be QuickBooks Online for newer users of nonprofit, newer nonprofit users. So if you're using the online version, please join us for that. Um, and then later this month we'll be talking about cultivating a library techno culture. So if you're joining us from the library sector, we'll have a webinar just for you on library tech workers and how to how to 
support technology in your library. Um, I don't have August events on here, but we will be covering topics from uh, web accessibility basics to uh, training your staff on how to use technology. So a lot of topics to come. Thank you so much, Greg. We really of appreciate course. carving out this time in your day. I know this is a, a lot, and we've, I hope, helped serve a lot of people or at least piqued their interest and given them resources on where to learn more. Uh, thank you so much to David, Ali, uh, Carol, Jennifer on the back end for really answering so many questions. We, we still have almost 150 questions that weren't <laughs> answered and more than 220 that were. So you know, we really have worked hard to try and bring you uh, the answers you need to help get your set up and at least hopefully brought you to some resources that can help you learn more. Lastly, I'd like to thank ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor, for providing the use of the platform. We really appreciate them offering this so we can pre present these webinars to you on a regular basis. And please, one more reminder to complete that post-event survey. That really helps us improve how we offer our programs. And can you can I just let us say, know what other topics you'd like. I just want to say one thing. QuickBooks can be exciting. It can be fun. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that you spend a lot of time on and it's a big nightmare. If you know what you're doing, it actually becomes fun and it frees you up. So what I want you to be able to do is to not have to worry about QuickBooks so much and spend your time either performing your mission, helping the kids, what have you, or taking donors out to lunch and asking them for money <laughs> rather than sitting here doing QuickBooks. So hopefully I will see you at the webinar or I'll be talking to you if you get the tech support. You got Thank you so much. And you know, we will be on here Thursday doing the same topic but for QuickBooks Online. And uh, you know, you're all welcome to join us for that one for free as well in case you may learn something about the setup there too. Thank you so much everyone. Have a terrific afternoon. All bye right. Bye-bye.